Hello and welcome to the 48th annual AAKP National Patient Meeting, Transforming American Kidney Health, Patients Taking the Lead. My name is Lana Schmidt, and I am a grateful kidney transplant recipient from Illinois. I was on dialysis 13 years, having experienced all the di different dialysis treatment methods and was on home hemodialysis before I received my transplant in 2016. I was diagnosed with a rare kidney disease called Good Pastures. A special drug, Solaris, was used to suppress my antibodies, allowing me to have a successful kidney transplant. And I'm now going on eight years with a kidney. I'm currently retired and I help mentor fellow kidney patients throughout the US through their kidney disease process of dialysis and the transplant journey. I have the honor of serving as a member of the AAKP Board of Directors and as an AAKP Ambassador. In serving in these positions, it has opened up so many opportunities for me to use my patient voice, especially with government officials, kidney doctors, kidney researchers, and fellow kidney patients. As a member of AAKP, I share the message that every kidney patient has the most important voice in determining their care plan. It is imperative that an environment is created that supports kidney disease research and innovations so that we are continually advancing care, improving treatments, and providing solutions for unmet patient needs. And when those innovations are FDA approved, it's crucial that all patients have access and the right to choose the treatment that is best for them. In consultation with their doctor, they can choose to care for them. So many patients can, can live their best life and achieve their aspirations, no matter their age. And with that, I'm pleased to announce our next session titled, Aging and the Kidneys. Our speaker for this session is a longtime AAKP champion, and I've been fortunate to personally work alongside him on many important kidney health initiatives. Dr. Stephen Fadum, is one of the kidney community's brightest minds. He is currently a practicing nephrologist, professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and chair of the AAKP Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Fadum was one of the first doctors to discover the value of the internet for patient education and founded several websites dedicated to public service and the dissemination of clinical information, including the Nephron Information Center, Wiki Kidney, Touch Calc, and dialysisunits.com. The accolades include recipient of the National Kidney Foundation's Distinguished Service Award, the AAKP Dr. Luden Award, and the AAKP Medical of Excellence. Un under the prior administration, Dr. Fadum received a Presidential Volunteer Service Award Gold Medal, and under the current administration, Dr. Fadum received the Presidential Volunteer Service Award Lifetime Achievement Award. He is listed in America's top doctors, serves as historian for the AAKP and a published author, having literally wrote the book 
on kidney disease. Dr. Fadum, it's an honor to have you join us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lana. And I hope everybody is enjoying the presentations. Today, I would like to talk about a, an old subject, aging. And I think that you will uh, enjoy this talk. I might uh, advise you in advance. First of all, this is a topic in development. And number two, there may be some complex uh, concepts here but I will also give you a list of books to read. And if you're interested, you can take this further so that you understand it very, very well. So my disclosures are that I'm a joint venture partner with Davida. I'm a principal investigator for Ardelix and Riata. I'm the medical director for two dialysis units, and I am the founder and uh, chief executive officer for Kidney Associates. That's my clinical practice. So today we're going to roughly go over four topics. Number one, an introduction to aging. What is aging? Number two, what is the aging cell? Number three, we're going to drill down and talk about aging in the kidney. And fourthly, we're going to try to bring this together with practical things that you and I can be doing right now to protecting ourselves from the inevitability of aging. So let's go over our objectives. I think that it's important that we recognize that aging occurs differently in different animals. For example, the Greenland shark over here can live to be about 400 years. And uh, so we want to recognize that and we wanna learn from the different animals why they live so long and how can we better ourselves. Number two, we wanna delve into the principles of aging, at least what we know about aging today. Now, when I looked at an old reference from 2011, it looked like I was in the Middle Ages reading a book from the Middle Ages. So we've been advancing in this topic very, very rapidly. And then we want to move onward and review the principles of aging that are unique to the kidney. What is it about the kidney that causes it to age in a very unique way? And as a kidney doctor, this is one of my principal interests. And number four, our objective is to recognize that there may be some modifiable factors that can reduce the effects of aging on the kidney. And we want to know what they are so that we can apply them and keep our kidneys healthy. Introduction to aging. Aging is the point where the process that keeps, well, an organism or anything operational is overwhelmed. And it doesn't have to be an organism. Everything ages. The earth ages, mountains age, living cells age. Wear and tear uh, is versus damage, versus combination uh, of the two is how we like to think of this. So let's look at the slide on the right. And that's from Greenland. And uh, Greenland was once covered with ice. Of course, you you know some of those ice age uh, sheets of ice are now melting, and when they do, they damage the underlying rocks. They is this wear and tear? Well, if it happens over a long period of time, and it's, it's erosion, it's called wear and tear or aging. But if it happens suddenly, such as an earthquake, then it might be called damage. So it's a matter of semantics, but really, and as we can learn from some of those old animals that live way deep in the ocean and seem to live several hundred years, wear and tear versus damage versus the combination of both of those is somewhat relative. 
So not all animals age the same. For example, the Antarctic sponge, uh, they'll forget these, a lot of these long living animals like to live in cold water. Uh, the Antarctic sponge can live 15,000 years. Now they cheat, they have extra stem cells. Clams can live greater than 500 years, unless of course they end up in a restaurant and they have a, a very low production of oxidative radicals or free radicals. Now the Greenland shark can live for 277 years and it has a very slow metabolism. The bowhead whale can live the longest living one was 211 years. And unfortunately it was killed in a hunting accident. It met a hunter and uh, it had a very slow metabolism. Uh, it was also resistant to cancer. In fact, it didn't even get cancer because there were so few mutations. And so it had a lot of gene adaptation so that it could repair any kind of damage almost instantly. The giant tortoise, and you met uh, uh, a giant tortoise from the Galapagos, but Jonathan is from the seashells, another area, rural area. It too is a giant tortoise, looks like the Galapagos tortoises. And he is still alive and he's over 190 years old. And he has a very slow metabolism, no predators, and a very good repair mechanism. Now, the naked mole rat lives way longer than any other rat. It can live 31 years and it has protective telomeres. So right now, if you haven't been reading a lot about this, you're saying, what is he talking about? I'm lost. But before you get up and walk out, bear with me, because there's a lot more that I'm gonna cover that's going to anticipate your questions and hopefully answer them. So it all starts with a cell. And that uh, thing on the right is a cell. If you eat an egg in the morning, that is likewise a cell. And all cells have a nucleus and then they have these little powerhouses called mitochondria. They have these uh, networks that are able to make proteins. And they uh, have a cytoskeleton and uh, they are uh, very active. Those little things you see in them are called organelles. Well, the cell undergoes wear and tear. However, it's often able to repair itself. So if it becomes damaged, it can fix itself. Now, after a while, the damage exceeds the repair. In other words, there's so much damage and so you have more damage and you have less repair mechanisms because they're weakening. And when that happens, we cannot make the needed proteins to sustain the cell. In other words, the enzymes, the mitochondria, all of the things that are necessary for the cell to function can no longer be sustained. And as a consequence, the cell is lost. And that leads to organ damage because if you lose a lot of cells, the organs that are made up of cells also die and that causes our bodies to dysfunction and ultimately die. So this is all transmitted at least in, in the, most of the eukaryocytes, this is transmitted by sex and it's terminal. So we can say that life is a sexually transmitted terminal condition. So what are the mechanisms of aging in a cell? What causes all this wear and tear? So here we are on a very, very rocky beach in Iceland. It used to be a volcano. And after several million years of erosion from the sea, these rocks are starting to deteriorate. And uh, even though they're beautiful and very photogenic, this is a classic sign of aging, geological aging. So let's look at 
the organism. What are the uh, mechanisms of aging in the organism? Well, uh, first of all, there's oxidation and there's inflammation. And I'm going to explain these. Number two, there's a very, very slow metabolism rate. Number three, there's gene adaptation. Number four, there's mitochondria. Number five, there's stem cells. Next, there's DNA repair. Then there's telomeres. And then there's autophagy. So any changes in these, like worsening oxidation and inflammation, a slow, uh, the metabolism is determined by genes. So it, this is where the gene adaptation comes in. And you also have genes that have to do with how your body handles sugar. And uh, the mitochondria make energy. And if you don't have any energy, the cell can't function. The decreased stem cells mean that the stem cells that are going to renew a cell that's breaking down, you don't have the stem cells to do that anymore. And then consequently, DNA breaks down, the little telomeres at the end of it make it break down, and then the cell can't recycle. So these are the major mechanisms of aging that we know today. Now, Tomorrow, there may be different mechanisms because this is an evolving field. So what about oxidation and inflammation? I promised that I would define some of these terms. Well, we all have to fight bacteria and viruses. And sometimes they win, but most of the times we do. So we have an immune system. Now, the immune system has two parts. It's got the reactionary part that instantly pushes back on any kind of uh, bacteria or virus and tries to fight it. Causes fever, a decreased appetite, and releases a bunch of hormones. And if you'll remember with COVID, the original COVID, they talked about the cytokine storms, and that was the innate mechanism taking place. Now, while this is happening, there's an underlying mechanism that takes place called the antibody antigen reaction. Now, this happens because of macrophages and macrophages are big eaters. And um, I'm sure they're the brunt of a lot of jokes. But anyway, they engulf the bad guy, that invader that's come into the body. The macrophages, uh, they're like big bullies and they go over and they kind of eat up the bad guy. And when they do, they create antigens from the bad guy's body parts. So they tear the bacteria into little bitty bits or the virus into little bitty bits. And then the body is going to make an antibody. We call those little bits antigens. And the body is going to make an antibody to those. And those antibodies will last for a while and they'll help fight the next invasion. Now, sometimes we can short circuit that mechanism with a flu shot or with a COVID booster. And we can basically give somebody those antibodies automatically so they can have them and that'll last for a few months. In some cases, it'll last for uh, forever. Luckily, the polio vaccines and uh, lasted forever. Smallpox lasts forever too. So when a cell attacks the invader, the cells that attack the invader, they release powerful oxidants. In other words, that's us. We're attacking the invader. We're going to re, uh, release oxidants and they're going to damage and, and uh, tear down the, the invader, but they also can scar and damage our innocent, healthy cells that were just standing by and they can lead to senescence or aging. And as we get older, our immune system changes. So let's say we have two atoms. We'll call atom 1A and atom 2B. And say atom 1 and atom 2 get together. And say atom 1 wants to uh, get rid of an electron. And atom B, might be oxygen, wants to gain an electron. So when that happens, atom one, because it gets rid of a negatively charged little particle, becomes positively charged. 
And we see that with protons, with uh, acid, becomes positively charged. But the other molecule, the other atom, say it's oxygen, it loves electrons. It's always running around trying to grab an electron. So it's going to be negatively charged. So oxidation is when you give away your electrons and reduction is when you accept the electrons and then you oxidize something else. So uh, things are oxidized because oxygen oxidizes them. That's a good way to remember it. And things are reduced like iron when it goes from ferric to ferrous, goes from three pluses down to two pluses, it loses a plus because it gained electrons. And uh, so that's, that's how the system works. Now, what happens if things go haywire? Well, an electron is a very, very powerful substance. And if you don't believe me, look outside during a lightning storm and watch the photons that have basically stimulated oxygen. And uh, when you have any kind of electrical current that is moving, that's, that's because of electrons. So you have electrons in your body and you also have electrons in the wall circuit. And so everything is moved by electrons. Uh, in fact, we kind of name this energy cycle, this energy process after the electrons, it's called electricity. And so what happens is if you have too much electron power floating around, the electricity is going to basically shock and damage some of the innocent tissues. And that's called oxidative stress or free radicals. And it's basically uh, damage to a cell. And that's what can cause aging. So if you live a mile in the sea and you don't have all the ultraviolet light and your molecules aren't moving very fast because it's cold, you have a better chance of living longer because you have less of this oxidative stress. So is this starting to make sense? It really is a beautiful concept. So what about that slow metabolism of living way deep, a thousand, two thousand meters deep, three, you know, three thousand, three thousand uh, feet uh, to six thousand feet down? and being a large animal, like a 50 foot long whale called the bowhead whale. These are very large animals. They don't have very many predators except for uh, fishermen with harpoons. Uh, and we're trying to get rid of that. And they have a very slow reproduction. They're in no hurry to reproduce because they have such a, 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 a small number of uh, they, their system is designed so they don't reproduce very rapidly. And for their body weight, which is tremendous, their testes are not that big. They only weigh 400 pounds instead of a half a ton. And so they don't really have that many babies that often. So they have a survival advantage. They have to live a long time because they, somebody has to live a long time to have those babies and to raise them. So if, if they had babies when they were young, it wouldn't matter if they got cancer or something. But because they live a long time, uh, they, have a, uh, they have a survival advantage to become older. Now, what are the factors that they're fighting? Number one, uh, they actually have a cold-induced RNA binding protein. They have a special protein that helps them to fight and, and stay comfortable in cold weather to, to help them repair if they do get ultraviolet light and helps them to repair in case they get hypoxic. Don't forget, these are mammals like we are. They used to be on land, but they go back to the sea now and they live there, but they still have to come up for breath and to get a, a gulp of air. And they, then they go back down. So they have to be able to fight hypoxia. They also have mitochondrial translation genes. So their mitochondria are more resistant to some of the factors that cause aging. 
they have less IGF, which means they have less, less of an immune uh, response uh, like we would have. And they don't have as much spermatogenesis because they're not going to have, they're not like salmon that are going to have lay a million eggs and then maybe die the next year or two. They're going to have one baby and that baby's going to uh, grow up and their you know, Nemo's going to live to be a long time. No, Nemo's not a whale, excuse me. But their little baby whale is going to live to be a long time. Now, I'm going to talk about somebody that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. This is Cynthia Kenyon. And Cynthia Kenyon is a professor in San Francisco who has looked at the genes that promote aging. And she's found several of them. And uh, so in roundworms, for example, the C. elegans uh, model, she found what was called the DAF2 gene. And these genes are able to, in us, encode the insulin receptor and growth factors. So it basically helps us with uh, insulin so that we can absorb insulin more rapidly. Now, people with mutations in this gene live longer. And uh, so if you have a mutation in your insulin-like growth factor, you're going to live longer. Whereas the opposite, if you have a defect in your insulin receptor substrate and you have insulin resistant, you're going to live a shorter life. So she also discovered that there was an entire mechanism that was designed to help promote this insulin system. And uh, it, it's called DAF16 in the uh, prokaryotes like yeast, and, uh, but, and also uh, I believe it's called DAF16 in the uh, roundworms. But in us, it's called FOXO. There's a, the F of FOXO. It's a forkhead uh, type of gene and it's required for this mutation to extend life. In other words, the mutation happens and then you have to have a good foxhole system to stay healthy. So um, you can think of that like the old expression, would you want this or that in your foxhole? Uh, would you like this person in your foxhole? Well, foxhole is good. So you want to have uh, whatever it is that makes FOXO work, you want to have that available. And what that is, is pretty simple. It's called staying away from food. It's called restricting your calories. Calorie restriction turns on this entire system. And it does it because it fools the body into thinking, oh my gosh, we need to conserve food, we're starving. So what that does, it turns on the mechanisms that slow metabolism and it uh, basically uh, helps the system to survive. Now, we say that reactive oxygen species are bad. Well, that's true in large amounts, but in a very, very low dose, they can actually stimulate repair. So if you go to the gym after this talk, and you work out, you're going to release some reactive oxygen species that are actually are going to help you to repair your muscles and become stronger. This is a fascinating system. It's, it's, you can't make this stuff up. So let's talk about the mitochondria. And this is a page out of the book that we just published called Staying Healthy with Kidney Disease. And we talk a lot about staying healthy with kidney disease, but then we have the back part of it. We talk about the, some of the real interesting uh, reactions that can take place that'll keep us healthy. And staying healthy is very similar, whether it's an organism or whether it's uh, a mitochondria, or whether it's a mitochondrion or whether it's a, a body cell or whether it's a kidney or whether it's us in general. So mitochondria are these tiny little organelles, these little bitty organs inside of cells, and they basically handle oxygen. So they have little Krebs cycles inside them that uh, 
when they get glucose or they get lipids, they metabolize those and they metabolize them so that they end up releasing electrons. So there we go, we're talking about electricity again. Well, what does an electron do? Well, it always wants to go somewhere. And when it does, it creates energy. And uh, it can create energy like a light bulb is an example of electrons uh, creating energy. Uh, lightning is an example of that energy. Heat can be an example of that energy. Or it can turn a piston in an electric car or it can just say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create this energy and we're going to create an, a, a bond. And we're going to take phosphorus, which is a very energetic substance, and we're going to bond it with something and it's going to store energy, sort of like a battery does. And it's going to store that energy until somebody needs that reaction. So that's how mitochondria work. And they work very, very well. They used to be bacteria but they decided they weren't doing very, very well with back, as bacteria. And so they merged with us and now the bacteria live inside our system. This has nothing to do with Elon Musk, but they are X. They are transmitted by the X chromosome. They are not transmitted by the Y chromosome. I don't know if Elon Musk knows that or not, but when you change the name of Twitter to X, X, the X chromosomes transmit the mitochondria, the Y chromosomes that the, the guys have. If you're a Y, you're a guy. Uh, we don't transmit the mitochondria. It's all moms. So if your uh, child is a super athlete, uh, the mother should take credit for it, not the father. So uh, mitochondria, they are very fascinating and uh sadly if they're they also because they handle uh oxygen if they don't handle the oxygen right they're the first ones to create those crazy electrons that cause a lot of damage not only do they do that but they gossip about it they'll tell other cells that hey i've got a bunch of electrons coming out and you're gonna die and so uh they really have a fascinating life and uh it's, it's worth reading about them. There's, there's a whole book written about them that I, I just love. Uh, it's right here. Uh, it's called Mitochondria and the Future of Medicine. This is just one of the great books that talks about mitochondria. Well, inside the mitochondria, you have a lot of really, really complicated things going on. And the bottom line is just take all of this and just look at it. When you see this thing, don't try to understand it as much as try to get the big picture. This is all generating electricity. So what about stem cells? Well, these are the wonderful cells that are scattered around our body and they're there to kind of rescue us. So if things go bad, the stem cells can come in and make new cells and we depend on them. But unfortunately, they're subject to the same aging mechanisms as everything else. So if you have an impaired DNA uh, uh, repair system and shortened telomeres, and we're gonna talk about telomeres in a minute. If you have mitochondrial dysfunction, decreased protein synthesis, then the stem cells, which have all of these things, they wear out and uh, we can't get renewed. So we either need to get a stem cell transplant and that's being worked on. That's, there's a lot of promise to that or we, we end up uh, not existing any longer. Now, the next is DNA repair. Now, DNA is the double helix. I'm sure you've seen it. It's been on everywhere. And uh, they wrap around histones. Histones are these big molecules and the DNA doesn't just coil like randomly coil. It actually is wrapped around a histone. So if it gets a break in it, then uh, uh, a methyl group tags it. Sort of like if you have somebody seeing a break in the street and the guy comes by to fix potholes and he'll spray it with yellow paint, and then uh, they'll tag it with yellow paint or something. Well, you can think of methylating and, and acetylating is like metal, uh, uh, yellow paint. So what happens is that the methylation happens and then it kind of lets us know that something needs to be repaired. 
And then what that does is it unwraps the, the DNA around the histone so that the repair mechanisms can get to it while it's unwrapped. And then when it gets to it, it fixes it and then it wraps it back up again. And then the DNA is as good as new. And uh, this happens a lot. And I mean, you have miles of DNA in your body and, and it's just not perfect. So you can imagine this DNA mechanism is extremely important. Without DNA mechanisms, uh, our cells can't make the necessary ingredients or we end up getting DNA that's imperfect and creates cancer cells. So there's a telomer. Not really, that's a shoelace, but it's the same concept. You have a shoelace and it's got this little plastic cap on it. And uh, I wore these shoes all over the Arctic and they got a lot of wear and tear. And you can see what happened. The one that was on the right, well, on my right, has its plastic cap, it did fine. But the one that didn't have that plastic cap started fraying. Well, the same exact thing that happens to your shoelaces happens to telomeres. And each time they divide, they lose some of the telomeres. And after a while, they lose their extra telomeres and then the cell can't do very well anymore. So we try to prevent the telomeres from going bad, like by drinking green tea and staying away from too much oxidation. And uh, by doing that, our telomeres last longer. We have enough telomeres if we stay really healthy to, to last until we're you know over 100 years old. So uh, don't worry about your telomeres unless you're doing things that, that just distract from your health. And unfortunately, we can't always avoid those things because that's part of uh, life as, as we live it. Uh, in the real world. Okay, I want to talk about my favorite subject, uh, mTOR. Now, how many biochemical receptors are so popular that a clothing company has actually named a line of clothing after them? And this is true because I buy mTOR shirts to wear all the time. And uh, so mTOR is extremely popular in the weightlifting and the fitness crowd. And there's a reason why. And we're going to get to that. Oh, now he's talking about Easter Island. Boy, am I all over the place. Okay, why am I talking about Easter Island when I'm talking about mTOR? Well, that's a fair question. Well, the reason is this is where it all started. Back uh, in the 1960s, this is a very, very remote part of the world, and it's very unique. It has these moai, and it's just uh, the wave runners settled it, and it's just very far away from everything. But what happened was they were going to build an airport here, and so people wanted to collect soil samples and excavate and learn everything they could about Easter Island before it became civilized. Uh, or I should say less civilized. Uh, but regardless, uh, the, soil, the soil samples that they uh, found uh, were named after the, the Rapa Nui people that lived on uh, Easter Island. So it's called Rapa Nui. And so uh, they called it rapamycin. And of course, as a kidney doctor, I know what rapamycin is because we used it for years to treat our transplant patients. In fact, the drug we're using right now, the calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus, like cyclosporin, all of these are some, somewhat related to rapamycin and rapamycin uh, uh, receptors. So anyway, the rapamycin stayed in a drawer in, a, in someone's freezer for several years with a sign on it, do not eat. And then somebody started looking at the rapamycin and saying, okay, this is good for cancer, it's, it's good for renal transplants, but how does it work? And when they started to figure out how it worked is when they came up with the most fascinating story. So this is how it works. mTOR goes in, remember we talked about insulin. So in, you have insulin receptors. The insulin receptors will either turn on or turn off FOXO, remember that DAF16 FOXO? And that will 
turn on or turn off mTOR. And mTOR does two things. One thing it does is it basically sweeps up inside the cell. It's the housekeeper in the cell. And it's, it turns by turning mTOR off, you turn on autophagy, which is the way that the cell keeps itself nice and neat. And if the cell doesn't keep itself nice and neat, then those little extra particles stimulate inflammatory reactions. But when mTOR is not doing that, in other words, when it eats some amino, when you eat some amino acids, so if you have a nice delicious egg in the morning and then you start exercising, you're telling your mTOR to turn on protein synthesis. So it's going to help you build your muscles. And that's, how mTOR works. It's got a dual action and it's fascinating because it can build muscles and it's also associated with longevity. That's what Cynthia um, Kenyon was talking about. So mTOR regulates the cell and that's the most important thing. That's pretty much what we're saying in this schematic, in this drawing. So. When you go to Easter Island, when I was so fascinated by mTOR that the last time I was in Antarctica, I flew back through Ushuaia, which is uh, in Argentina. And then I made a side trip up to Ecuador and I flew over to Easter Island. I not only photographed the, those Rapa Nui, but I spent a whole day looking for exactly where they found Rapa Mice. And it was, uh, inside one of the volcanoes. And that night I got out with my National Geographic photographer at midnight to photograph the Milky Way. It was this bright. All those moai are actually lit up by a little flashlight that we took from the hotel. And this was the most amazing scene that I'd ever seen in my life. So um, this, is, uh, this is how I remember Easter Island. So let's move now away from Easter Island and let's move down to the kidney. When kidney function declines, it's going to decline in about 60% of the elderly, but it's going to stay normal in 36%. So your kidney function doesn't have to decline. And I know we all say aging is natural. It's normal for our kidneys to get old, but it doesn't have to happen. The decline in kidney function may not be significant unless there's another disease. So even if the kidneys do decline, the body can live very well with the decreased kidney reserve unless you have another disease that's going to potentiate aging. And that disease would be something like uh, manifestations of hypertension or diabetes or lupus or an infection. Now, the things that damage the podocyte, which is the important part of the cell that has to do with the filtering mechanism, angiotensin, uh, the elevation in blood pressure, uh, insulin resistance, and cell growth, all can damage the cell. And a lot of these are potentiated by angiotensin. Clotho is another compound. This is a very important receptor in the body for FGF23 that has to do when you eat too much phosphorus, your body increases FGF23 and FGF23 goes and it turns off uh, clotho and clotho uh, blocks aging. So you want to keep the FGF23 levels as low as possible. That's why we tell people don't eat a lot of phosphorus in their diet. And uh, not only does it protect the kidneys, but it may protect against aging. So we eating the kind of the, some of the foods we eat today may help to prevent aging, but sometimes it may potentiate aging. The telomeres, they respond to oxidative stress in the kidney as they do everywhere else. Uh, SGLT1 and 2, the SGLT2 and SGLT1 inhibitors can uh, block the hyperfiltration. So if the kidney is damaged or if the kidney is stimulated, it filters too much. And next we have inflammation. Then we have diet and uh, proteins, fats, and acids. 
and then uh, we have high blood sugar. And these are all part of the aging mechanisms that, that will affect the kidney. So the factors associated with aging, like I said, angiotensin II, glucose, blood pressure, hyperfiltration, inflammation, oxygen, oxygen radicals that come from inflammation and from damaged mitochondria, DNA damage that can't be repaired, and telomeres. And telomeres are, are not in, say, cells like the podocytes because those are uh, cells that are terminally differentiated. In other words, that the podocyte can't regenerate itself. So I don't believe the telomeres are a big problem for podocytes, but they are for other cells in the kidney. So the podocyte, the podocytes line the glomerular membrane. And as the podocyte ages, it can't sustain itself and it drops out. Then there are fewer filters. And so the filters that are left have to work even harder. Did I say work harder? Uh, that means they hyperfilter. So then you have hyperfiltration. And that is very damaging. Inflammatory conditions like glomerular nephritis can affect the podocyte's ability to handle protein. And protein itself is damaging to the cell. And it can stimulate SGLT. It can stimulate many other things. So that's why we potentiate, uh, we want to use drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors, angiotensin blockers, uh, anything that can interfere with aldosterone and angiotensin. And we want to try to protect the kidneys through these mechanisms. Diabetes can turn on pathways that cause scar tissue formation. Now we call uh, scar tissue formation fibrosis. It's a lot easier to say than scar tissue formation. And what happens is you get scarring and damage in areas that support the glomerulus. And so when the housekeeper in the cell goes bad, the cell goes bad. And not only is the filter scarred, uh, but the areas around it are, and this is all related to just plain old sugar. So we want to keep that sugar level down. Hypertension causes pressure on the blood vessel wall. And that causes the wall to release less nitrogen. And then the wall of the blood vessel becomes scarred and narrowed. And that makes the blood pressure even worse. So these are the major mechanisms that work inside the kidney to make the kidney age. So let's look at a picture. Here we have uh, an arterial going into the kidney. We have an arterial coming out of the kidney, the afferent and, arterial and efferent. We have uh, this uh, TGF, we have the mesangial cell, very important cell, and uh, it can respond by getting fibrotic. Uh, angiotensin stimulates everything bad. It stimulates efferent arterial to narrow, and it stimulates the mes mesangial cell to release TGF beta, which is a hormone which causes all of this fibrosis to take place. Now on the other side, you have hyperfiltration and hyperfiltration can stimulate a high pressure inside the blood vessel, but the blood vessel has a mechanism in the mesangium, which turns that off and causes the blood vessel to narrow again. That's called tubuloglomerular feedback. And that's a very important mechanism and that wears out with time. That's why we like people to take finenerone or we like them to take uh, some of the jar, uh, Jardians or we want them to take Parxiga because they work on this mechanism. We also want them on a low protein diet or a plant-based uh, diet. We also want people to stay away from salt and we want them to stay away from too much acid in their diet. They all affect this area of the kidney. So here's another picture. And this talks about the same thing. This is that macula densa area I was talking about. These cells right here do a lot of good for the body. They can control that flow of blood into the body and help shut down the hyperfiltration. But when they get worn out, that doesn't happen anymore. So we wanna stop the arterial from dilating we want to 
uh, do something to stop the endothelial cell resistance, which is causing the high blood pressure. And we want to uh, be very careful because if you get too much sodium in the distal tubule, it constricts the afferent arterial. So when you give somebody uh, Farxiga or Jardians, that's exactly what it does. Not only does it get rid of sugar, but it also puts sodium in the distal tubule. And then it runs right back around and loops right next to the glomerulus and, and, and blocks hyperfiltration. So that's exactly how uh, some of these new SGLT2 inhibitors work. Now, meanwhile, you have sugar. Now you can take uh, sugar and you can put it on uh, a turkey or, well, you can put it on a ham and you can put it in the oven and bake it and you'll get caramelization. But what you can do is you can have sugar in your body for about 30 or 40 years and it can cause a reaction to take place, which is very similar. So essentially, long-standing doses of sugar in the body cause caramelization of the cells in the body. We don't call it caramelization. We call it the development of advanced glycation end products or age. So that's a real problem. And then all of this interferes with the mitochondria. So the mitochondria doesn't work like it's supposed to. That increases more free radicals and the free radicals just go haywire. They go everywhere. And then they add further damage to tissues. So you can see how hypertension and diabetes, they're very similar and they work together and can potentiate aging. So what can we do to stay healthy? Well, why am I showing this slide when I'm talking about health? Because this is uh, the planet we live on. And uh, this is an example of uh, what's going on right now as we speak. This is a very unhealthy glacier. This glacier should be a solid sheet of ice, but you can see with perpetual warming that it has started to ice. This ice has started to melt and pieces of it are breaking off and going into the sea. This is the Arctic Sea. And this is what's happening to the glaciers. So um, we wanna keep our planet healthy, but we also wanna keep ourselves healthy. So how can we do that? So let's talk about muscles. Muscles are fascinating. And what they do is they have two fibers that, that kind of connect to, to each other and they get shorter or longer. And that's what causes our muscles to flex. And the thing about that is that it's a very sensitive mechanism and it's very, very important because if you don't have muscles flexing, your bones deteriorate and you get inflammation and you become frail. So the thing about muscles is if you don't use your muscles, in other words, if you lay around and, or you sit around and you don't use them, your body sends a signal called ubiquitin. And the ubiquitin uh, comes through a very uh, interesting mechanism that will cause it to bind to muscle proteins. And then it takes the muscle proteins to this gigantic uh, proteasome and the proteasome will basically eat up the muscle and recycle it and generate out little peptides and little amino acids because it wants the body, it's very efficient. So it's just like if you're in a restaurant, you don't eat all your food and the waiter comes and starts taking it away before you finish. And uh, that's what happens to your muscles. They get taken away before your time because you didn't use them, because you didn't eat and you didn't, uh, your food goes away and like the same with the muscles. So that's what happens. It's, it's unfortunately a very simple concept, but it's a very real concept. And it's so real that we, as we age, lose 1% of muscle every year. So when I read that, I said, hey, uh, that ain't me. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So I went to my gym and I started working out every day and I was able to keep my muscles healthy by doing that. So I was able to show that you can maintain muscles if you exercise. So you have to exercise. Exercise will reduce inflammation. It will keep your muscles healthy. 
will it expand your lifespan? I, I don't know, but um, I know that you feel better and uh, it improves your quality of life. So next I want to talk about protons. Now, we're going to go way up into the sky to talk about these. We're going to actually go back to the sun. So protons, these little hydrogen and particles, H pluses, are these little positively charged molecules. And their journey begins in the sun with nuclear fusion, when you have hydrogen, which forms helium, and you have uh, some uh, electrons, you have some protons that, uh, and, and they're going to uh, be shot out. You're gonna have a, a hydrogen bomb type reaction, which is so powerful it's going to shoot protons out into space very, very rapidly. And they're going to continue in space until something stops them. So when they come to Earth, they combine with electrons. Now, anytime something combines with an electron, guess what happens? You have a flash of light or you have an electrical charge. And so that's exactly what happens. You have these little electrical charges in the night sky because these protons from the sun are hitting the night sky and the magnetism on the earth is causing this reaction to take place because it's attracting these uh, protons but luckily it's keeping them away from us it's moving them way out into the ozone layers and we're not ending up with a lot of these bombarding us because it would be very damaging the protons can be destructive if they have a direct hit. We call that metabolic acidosis in the body, and we call that destroying uh, coral reefs in the ocean. So when a proton hits one of Earth's oxygens, releases an electron that's attracted by an other electron, it creates a flash of light, which causes the northern lights. And if you happen to be out there with a camera, this is what you get. And it's a beautiful scene. These are constantly flickering, constantly moving. They're fun to photograph, but I'm glad it's far away. So let's talk about protons on Earth. Let's get back to reality here. We are about to finish. And our body has a certain number of protons. And these protons can be counted. If we have too many protons, then they damage our cells. And that's called acidosis. And the kidney can't do its job by getting rid of the protons, and that's why we have an accumulation of them. These are harmful to the cells, and they turn on signals that will break down muscles, and they will also cause insulin resistance. So when you think of the beautiful northern lights, also think of metabolic acidosis, which isn't so beautiful, and how you want to block that. And the best way to block it is to eat plant-based diet. Plants have figured out a lot of, uh, on how to handle uh, things and they're uh, basically alkali. So they know what to do when they're bombarded with any stray protons. And likewise, by, they, they're alkali. And also bicarbonate tablets uh, can help control its harm. And so bicarbonate's very important with kidney disease to take bicarbonate. You can get over the counter 17 to 25 dollars at amazon you get a thousand of them take one of them two or three times a day check with your doctor first but that helps protect the kidneys probably from aging and also from disease so i said alkali uh foods uh protect you and don wesson actually showed this in a research study uh we took a list of all of his foods and photographed them so all of this stuff is healthy some of it may have a little bit more potassium than you'd like, but it's still relatively healthy food and it'll help to preserve kidney function. So what about salt? Okay, we evolved as two-legged creatures. We weren't two-legged at all times. We were once four-legged, but about 30 some odd million years ago, the climate started changing and the Rift Valley started in Africa. And when it did, it created a desert and, uh, for an advantage, we started adapting by walking upright. And when we did, we had to use a lot more energy. So we lost hair all over our bodies to dissipate heat. And that way, that way we could sweat 
And we also, uh, because there was water scarcity, this was a desert, this led to mechanisms to conserve water. So if your ancestors come from a sub-Sahara area, there's a good chance your body is designed to, to conserve water and you're not going to, you're going to handle salt differently. In other words, you're going to uh, retain salt for a longer period of time. Now, back in those days, there wasn't a salt shaker. There are no salt shakers on the Serengeti and there were no salt shakers when Lucy came around about six million years ago. But in the last few thousand years, we've developed salt as part of our agriculture. So we eat way more salt than the human being was ever, ever, ever intended to eat. So what happens is the same mechanism, which helps us to conserve water, causes too much salt and too much water to be present in the blood vessels, and that damages our blood vessels. That's why one third of the people on this planet have high blood pressure. High blood pressure is caused because the pressure of salt beats against the blood vessel walls. It creates free radicals. It decreases the nitrogen. The blood vessels stiffen. That puts a lot of work on the heart and a lot of work on the kidneys. It, uh, it stimulates that growth factor we mentioned, TGF-beta, which causes scar tissue formation. So the next thing we want to do is control our blood pressure. So what do we do to control hyperfiltration? Well, we talked about this before, but just to wrap it up, a low protein diet, or at least a plant-based diet, blood pressure control, the metabolic syndrome, try to control that with diet, and sometimes metformin and sometimes other uh, diabetic medicines, and also exercise, SGLT2 inhibitors, ACE and ARBs, and also the non steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonists it's, uh, like phenenterone. All of these drugs may help protect aging. So that's why we want to do this. So plant-based diets, as I mentioned, they have to do with the afferent arteriole and they have to do with hyperfiltration. That's their number one thing. So let's go to the next slide and this will be the wrap up. Number one, we want to eat healthy, but not too much. Number two, we want to avoid excess sugar. Number three, we want to control the high blood pressure. Number four, we want to control metabolic acidosis. Number five, we want to, if we have hypertension, we certainly want to consider an ACE or an ARB therapy. Number six, we need to reduce dietary sodium back down to two grams a day. Uh, number seven, if we're smoking cigarettes, it's time to quit. Number eight, we need to maximize our intake of fruits and vegetables. Number nine, we need to exercise. Number 10, we need to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. So that's not only true for the body, but it's also true for the kidneys. Sometimes eating certain foods, uh, flavonoids can help. Uh, we talk a lot about NAD plus and coenzyme Q10. These may be helpful supplements. Uh, they may help reduce inflammation. Um, there's just a lot of supplements out there, and I don't know which ones work and don't work, but I do know that eating healthy is probably the best thing we can do. Okay, I want to thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I'm uh, in the process of writing a book on aging. Uh, there are several books, in addition to the mitochondrial book, that are available that you might want to consider um, one is Nick Lane's The Vital Question, excellent book, and uh, it's not difficult to understand. You can also listen to it on Audible if you want to understand the role that oxygen has played in uh, life. Uh, this is also by Nick Lane. It, too, is an outstanding book. My favorite book of all is Andrew Steele's book on Ageless. This is the title, Ageless. It's a fascinating book that goes over much of what I've talked about. And I can also recommend uh, any one of the series. We have uh, several chapters in these books, Issues in Kidney Disease. And uh, then we have the, the book, Staying Healthy with Kidney Disease. We're working on a new book uh, on aging in the kidney. Uh, most of our books are, have been either with Nova or with Springer. This book is going to be with Elsevier. 
and it should be uh, ready in uh, perhaps a, about a year and a half. And uh, this is a, a fascinating subject and something which I'm just diving into, but I'm, I'm very fascinated by it. So um, I want to uh, turn this back over to uh, Lana, and I want to thank you very, very much for your attention during this uh, very uh, fascinating uh this, this talk on this very, very fascinating subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fadum, for yet another amazing and informative presentation. On behalf of AAKP, I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise and current research with us.